we have been studying this amazing moment that we find in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus sat down on a hill and began to speak. And we realize that the word that was made flesh to dwell among us was now speaking word upon those people. And that those words were then recorded and, and are brought to us in the pages of our scripture today. We call this the Sermon on the Mount, but it's the Sermon of All Sermons. We're now in the second section of that sermon. And Jesus, uh, in this part, begins to... Uh, to focus on 12 different topics. And uh, they may not be the things that we would have first thought of, but the more we contemplate the things that Jesus thought uh, were important, boy, these are, are really powerful topics for us. Anger and lust, divorce, honesty, retaliation, enemies, uh, the needy, how do we treat the needy, uh, prayer, fasting, treasures, judging and asking, how do we ask? As he was doing this, he was focusing on the spirit of the law, which is different from the letter of the law. The people of that day had the letter of the law down. Uh, they, had, they had completely down to the minutia of detail, figured out how to obey the letter of the law, but they had lost so much of what God really wanted to be doing in the hearts of his people. And so Jesus began, we saw last week, by peeling back the layers of tradition that had been attached uh, to the things, the precepts and the directives of God. And he was dealing with what I call the matters of the heart. We hear him again and again saying, but here in the heart is uh, the thing that I am concerned with. Last week we dealt with anger, and this week uh, we're going to deal with lust. So I invite you to uh, follow along as we look at Matthew chapter 5, beginning verse 27, and hear the word on uh, this matter of lust. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, let's stand and let's pray. Lord God, we need your help. <laughs> because these words, they cut and they pierce in a way that, that we haven't heard anywhere else in Scripture. And so, Lord, speak to us and show us and illumine your word. Come into your word and make it alive to us so that we can know exactly what you are saying, but also how we are to respond. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So the number two on the list that Jesus wanted to deal with is this uh, thing that we call lust. And I have to admit to you that uh, it's not one of those uh, topics that you see uh, advertised here and there. If we offered a class uh, for our, uh, our midweek uh, studies and we said we're going to have a class uh, uh, at prime time on lust and put a sign on the door, this is the lust class, I think no one would show up. <laughs> And there's a couple reasons. Either we don't want to deal with it or we think we don't have to deal with it. And that's just the thing about a topic like that. I remember when I was in college and we were in uh, guys' Bible studies, we dealt with this a lot, especially in the springtime. Uh, and so, uh, we, we, you know, we, it was something that we talked about and we studied and we dealt with. But Jesus begins uh, this topic um, in the same way, in the same pattern as six of the topics, he says, you have heard that it was said. Uh, and he says, you have heard, you shall not commit adultery. He starts with that big one. And it's a, it's a command within the law. We know that. Uh, and then he goes on and he says, but I say to you, everyone who even just looks 
at another person uh, with lustful intent has already committed adultery uh, in their heart. And so Jesus is once again declaring that the heart is the arena that God wants to deal with. It's not just getting us to, to not act in certain ways or obey a certain set of rules in a particular way. Uh, he wants to deal with the matters of, of our hearts because that's so very important. That's the place that he wants to dwell in, the place that he uh, wants to reside. So this seventh commandment that uh, Jesus lifts up uh, forbids something called adultery. Well, what is that? The Hebrew word is na'af. Say that with me, na'af. And it means just in a broad sense to break wedlock, to break the bond of marriage. Now, it was understood to be a sexual matter, a matter of, of a sexual uh, infidelity uh, against uh, a marriage or with a person who is not your spouse. And that was actually before or after marriage was considered adultery. Uh, and the scripture talks about that. But Jewish interpretation uh, often treated adultery not as an issue of purity, but as an issue or a matter of theft. It's very interesting. In other words, and it's not that a person is property, but it is a matter of stealing something that is not yours, whether that's before marriage or after marriage or during marriage, taking something that does not belong to you, because in biblical thought, sexual intimacy is reserved for one person, the wife or the husband of that person. Now, the Hebrew word for adultery, it's not limited just to sexual infidelity. Uh, it, it refers to a, a broader sense of breaking the bond of wedlock, and that could occur in an emotional way or in a spiritual way. And it's important for us to understand that because we even talk today, someone will say, well, I, I was having an emotional affair, but we didn't continue. Well, no, that's what this is talking about. That, that is still an infidelity. That is still a form of, idol, of adultery. So Jesus then, he uses a different word. We're talking about Old Testament. He referred to the Old Testament. But he uses a New Testament word because he's the New Testament guy. And uh, the Greek word is moikuo. So let's say that together, moikuo. And it means just in the broad sense to commit adultery, but also... Uh, meant to be apostate, which means to fall away from the faith or to break a bond of faithfulness. And so it's used in the New Testament uh, and also in, in translation of the Old Testament to talk about falling away. In other words, an apostate is a person who has fallen away from the faith who has denied the faith, who has said, I don't believe in God, I don't believe in Jesus, I don't believe in the scripture, that is an apostate person. And so these, these are linked together in this word. Now that shouldn't really surprise us, because if you remember in the Old Testament scripture, idolatry was always uh, referred to as adultery against God. And so when someone would, uh, would set up an idol, whether it was... Uh, bringing an idol into the temple, what, what an abomination, or bringing a, a, an idol into your house, or choosing an idol, I'm going to worship this little God because I think this little God will help me with the things that I really want, uh, and more than uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob will, that's idolatry, and it was so painful to the heart of God that it's described as adultery. And so that image is used to describe Israel's unfaithfulness to God. You see it in the book of Hosea, uh, this whole picture of, uh, of idolatry falling away as adultery. It's similar to the sin of murder that we talked about, where adultery uh, is an act of godship. That is taking into our own hands choices that belong to God. And in the same way that we talked about how anger becomes murder, we're taking into our hands something that belongs only to God. We make ourselves the God of our own lives to gain what we have wanted or we have desired in our hearts. Now, to kind of get a handle on all of this, we have to realize that God created us humans, the human heart, with a capacity for passionate desire. Uh, we are not animals. 
in a whole lot of different ways. We, you know, animals don't, don't have moral reasoning. They, they don't think about it. But we are also not animals in that we don't just react uh, to uh, spontaneous uh, urges. We don't just react uh, as animals do. Uh, but we actually uh, have passionate desires in our, in our life, and we can nurture those. I, as I was studying this this week, it, it occurred to me, this is another reflection of the image of God. We study our creation, and, and we learn that we are created in the image of God, and part of that is passionate desire. Did you know that God has passionate desire? It's part of who he is. It's part of his image. And what does he passionately desire? He passionately desires you and a relationship with you and to be in communion and to be in fellowship with you. That's what God's passionate desire is. And for you to return to him with passionate desire. That's what worship is all about. That's what the study of God's word is all about. And so he passionately desires us and that's reflected in us. But we are to passionately desire the right things, the things of God. Psalm 42, I love this, and, and it's familiar to us. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? I'm ready, ready to appear before God because I, I long, I pant, I thirst for him. Psalm 73, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. So passionate desire is a good thing. It's something that he created in us, and it, but it's a, it's a wonderful thing when it's directed correctly at the right things. You know, Jesus, just a few verses ago, in this chapter of the Bible, said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst, who are, who are famished for righteousness, for the righteousness of God, for they shall be satisfied, who thirst for the righteousness of God. So as believers, we are called to cultivate a passionate desire for God. That's, that's what we've been doing this morning. As we come together, as we gather together, as we greet one another, as we open the word of God, as we say a prayer, as, as we lift our voices and our hearts in worship, as we are led into worship, we are cultivating a passionate desire for God, for his word, for serving the kingdom of God, and for prayer, uh, be, being connected with him. The problem is that passionate desire can so easily get pointed in the wrong direction. A desire gets, gets off the track, gets derailed in some way. And that's what Jesus was talking about when he said everyone who looks with lustful intent. It's an interesting way that uh, word that he used in the Greek. Uh, it's the word epithumeo. Say that with me, epithumeo. And it means covetous desire, but it means a little bit more than that. The word that's at the center root of that is the word thumos. And it's, it's kind of a favorite word when it pops up in the Greek uh, for me because it tells me something specific. It means heated. Uh, the root word, uh, it's the root word for thermos. You know what a thermos is. It's something that contains, it's containing something that's heated or thermometer. So... Jesus was describing a heated desire. We know, what, we know what that feels like. A heated desire to take hold of something that is not ours. To take hold of something that is not intended for us. To, to take hold of something that uh, is not in God's best plan for us. It means to set our heart upon that thing in a heated way. So this is lust. Lust is a passionate desire focused on something that God has forbidden. Uh, James 1 describes it uh, this way, describes really the process. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then, when, when there's not a pause button there, 
Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth satisfaction. No, that's not what it says. Death. It's the thing, it's the thing that kills our relationship with God and ultimately uh, is the death of us. The NIV uh, translates this, he is dragged away and enticed. I think it's a really good description. We get dragged away when we don't hit the pause button somewhere along this process. Our desires can be dragged in the wrong direction. So lust, lust is a desire for the wrong thing, but it can also be the desire for the right thing in the wrong timing. And we see that an awful lot. We see that all the time these days. The desire for the right thing, but in the wrong timing before marriage. It's such an easy rationalization to make. I read a statistic recently that 70% of those who marry have cohabited before they marry. And it's actually a very dangerous thing. It lowers the success of marriage about 33%. And people say, well, well, I read in the magazine that it was really good to try things out. Well, you didn't read it in my magazine. My magazine is called the Holy Bible. All right? Come on. <laughs> Amen. It's important. So lust is a desire that's left unrestrained. You know, I like the idea of a pause button along the way. Listen to where the origins of sin are described in Genesis chapter 3. So when the woman, and by the way, the man was standing right there, but when the woman saw the tr that the tree was good for food, she saw it. There's no problem with seeing. And that it was a delight to the eyes. There's not a real big problem with that. And that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She stood there thinking about it. Boy, I think I'd like that wisdom uh, that is there, the, the knowledge of good and evil. She took of the tree and ate. And then she handed it to her husband who was sitting there going, okay. Come on. <laughs> it, just, just don't think, guys, that, that he was innocent in all of this. Now listen to that process once again. It started with a look. And we know that you can go to the next slide. It started with a look. And the look is not the problem. She saw that the tree was good. And then, and then it continued with what I call the linger, the lingering. She saw and it was a delight to the eyes and she contemplated the delight. And then uh, she didn't hit the pause button. <laughs> and she moved to the area of lust to be desired. And then the look became a took. <laughs> and that's what we see here. So what we want to see is that there is a process here where we can hit a pause button. We can stop things along the way. And that was the problem in, uh, in the garden, uh, Genesis chapter 3. And we also want to understand that lust in itself is not the same as temptation. Uh, Jesus was tempted, but he did not sin. Why don't we say that out loud together? It's so important. Jesus was tempted, but he did not sin. Jesus never fell into an unrestrained desire, heated desire for the things that the devil put before him. And he, uh, you know, here he was, he was uh, led into the desert in this time of temptation. And, and the devil said, well, why don't you, you're so hungry after 40 days, why don't you turn these rocks into bread? Or, or why don't you uh, make a big deal and jump off of this high place? Or I'll give you all of these things that are before you. He, he put these temptations before him, but Jesus was never moved in that direction to sin. Uh, the temptation was there. So temptation is not the same as sin. In fact, uh, Hebrews chapter 4 says that Jesus, your Savior, my Savior, was tempted in all ways. Now, that's a big statement. That means that whatever you've gone through, whatever you've experienced, whatever the hard things you've dealt with, Jesus was tempted, tested in all ways, and yet was without sin. So sin is what happens in our heart and then in our actions when we fail to turn away. Jesus turned away. How did, how did he do it? Do you remember? He did it with the word of God. Every single temptation that came to him. In fact, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to study this in the student message. But every, every single temptation that came, it's the word of God. Jesus just stated the word of God. No, that's a lie. That's a lie. That's a lie. 
Let me tell you the truth. So the word of God, the reason we focus, some people don't, don't understand why we focus so much on the word of God. It's so we will be prepared for the things that we deal with out there. So Jesus was focused on the heart beyond just avoiding somehow uh, the acts of adultery. Uh, he, he was trying to deal with a purity in our hearts uh, that was deeper than that that goes down, uh, that would keep us from going down the pathway of lust. Um, the 10th command talks about this explicitly. Exodus chapter 20. Now this is 10 of the big 10. Uh, you could say it's almost like an add-on, but it's not. It's so important and it deals with all of the other ones. He says, you shall not covet is the word, the Hebrew word. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything, his truck or, or his uh, boat. <laughs> We're not to covet. Now, what does that word covet mean? Uh, the word is chamad. Say that with me, chamad. And it means to delight in beauty. Well, but beyond that, to desire, to lust after a pleasant or precious thing. It goes beyond just noticing. Wow, nice truck. <laughs> wow, a fantastic boat you have. It's, it goes beyond that. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Because when we move beyond that, we actually move to the level of theft. Where, where, we, where we try to figure out a way to have that thing. Now later, Jesus is going to tell us how. Ask, seek, and knock. And it'll all, it'll all get figured out with God. But so many times we, we try to figure it out. Well, okay, I may not steal it, but I, I can figure out a way to leverage and go into enough debt that I can have that thing right now. And, and friends, that's actually one of the biggest problems that we have in our culture right now today. You see, and it just kind of leads into a really important, two big important pieces of this. And, and, and the first problem is that much of our economy is built on lust and covetousness. Advertisers, they're not content to just show you, let me show you how practical this product is. This will meet your needs. And, uh, and we think it's affordable. We think it will work for you, but we'll work with you, you know, to help you know that it's affordable, to, you know, and it will meet your needs. No, that's not it at all. We want you to buy it. Whether you can afford it or not, we want you to buy it. Uh, wh whether it's the best thing for you, we want you to buy it we, because that's how we make our bottom line. You know, I've never watched an advertisement that at the end, you know how they have the little warning things about, uh, they talk really fast, you know, the drug commercials. They tell you all these horrible things that will happen if you take this drug. But they never have a warning that says purchases, uh, purchasers uh, should carefully pray and consult with their spouse about every large purchase in their life. I've never heard that of you, not once. I've never heard a caution. Uh, caution, overextending your debt can damage credit rating and financial future. Have you ever heard that? I have to say that one of the most annoying things that, that I've experienced is to go in, and maybe it's happened to you, I've gone in to buy a car and I'm sitting there in the little room and, and the guy, I've, I've said, this is what I, I can afford, the payment that I can afford uh, each month, I've got my budget figured out. And I say, this is the, the, the number that I can afford. And then uh, the guy comes back and he says, well, I've worked on the numbers and, and, and here's the number. And it's $100 more than what I told him. And then this, no, no lie, this is exactly what happened. He turns to me and he says, well, you can afford that. Have you ever had that happen? It just, and, and I just, you know, I'm a nice man or I would have smacked him. You have no idea what I can afford because you don't know anything about my life. You don't know that I happen to tithe and I'm trying to save uh, in order to put my kids into school and get them through school. There's a lot of other things in my budget. You can afford that. You're approved for it. So just spend everything you're approved for. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And so this is what goes on out there. And then there's also the whole other side. We live in a world that sells sex. Because sex sells. It's the most powerful way uh, to convince you to set aside your thoughtful decision-making process. 
Make it look sexy, okay? You know, I, I've sat, I, Pastor Ann and I have sat watching television and I've just literally turned to her and I've said, what does that scantily clad man or scantily clad woman have anything to do with the product they're selling? You follow me? I mean, you're just sitting there going, oh my goodness, this is embarrassing. What, what is going on with this thing? Uh, that, that this is out there to try to sell this particular thing. There's, and it's not just that. It's lots of other things. There's one commercial. Um, it was playing over the last month or so. We were watching the football playoffs and, and, the, uh, and the, uh, the bowl games and all that sort of thing. There's one commercial. It must have played a hundred times. And it starts out where there's this um, beautiful lady and she's driving along in this car. And in the back seat are a couple of kids and they're a little bit distracted. They're lovely, beautiful, the kids you'd love to have. And then all of a sudden snowflakes start coming out of the air. Do you know the one I'm talking about? Have you seen that? And the snowflakes start coming out of the air. And then she, they're all going, what's going on? They turn in the driveway and there's the handsome husband out there and he's got a snowblower. They're in the desert, but he's blowing snow. And they turn into this beautiful house by this car. Because if I buy that car, well, well do, I, do I get that wife and those kids and that house and that husband? And this is the way we sell things in, 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 our, in our culture. And we need to be looking out for these things. It's a scary, scary sort of a thing. So the question that we begin to ask is, well, when does it become lust? Um, when does it turn that corner to become something more than just noticing someone or something that's beautiful or, or is uh, good to look at in some sense. And one of the things that we have to understand, and, and most everybody who writes about this says, is that a look is not a lust. And we need to know that. That we, we many times can't help but see something. It's what happens next. It's the turning away or not turning away. That makes the difference. Uh, there's a, a, a little quote that you may have seen somewhere. It's really a, a good one. It says, we cannot stop the birds from flying overhead, but we don't have to let them make a nest in our hair. <laughs> and that's, that's where we turn the corner. It's not looking away because that opens the door to lust. I confess to you that I have walked down the beach with my wife and it's been difficult because I don't know where to look to avert my eyes once again. But I'm not going to insult, I'm not going to stand, walk down the, the, the beach with my wife and, uh, and, and somehow dishonor her by staring at someone that's coming down the beach. I, I know folks that will not go to the beach during certain hours of the day because it's just sort of too dangerous in this arena. It's that not looking away that opens the door. Dwelling in the look opens the door of desire. That's where it continues on. That's where it, it starts. Uh, and that's what Jesus was talking about. Desire that leads to imagination and imagination that leads to lustful intent, as Jesus himself put it. And then that leads to a plan of action of, of some sort. So... I also want to say that lust is not just a sexual issue. If we study it a little bit, you might say, well, I don't really worry about that much anymore. It has to do with a whole lot of other things. Our sinful nature will lust for power, fame, money, position, popularity, recognition, and a whole lot of other things. The Roman historian Tacitus, uh, first century Roman historian, he said that the lust for power, for dominating others, inflames the heart more than any other passion. Now, I don't know that that's true, that, but in the first century Roman culture, that was his conclusion. And it's a very powerful one to think about in the day that we live in, to be careful of the lust for power, because it's a huge issue uh, in, in our world today. If I were to define this, I would say that lust is any unrestrained desire for something God has not planned for you. And it may not be that he's never planned it, but it may be the wrong timing, as I said earlier. Lust breaks the proper order of asking, seeking, and knocking, figuring out with God the way that he's going to give 
all the things to be added unto you. When we meet a person and we're attracted to them, uh, we're attracted and we begin praying about that. When I met Pastor Ann, I, have no, I knew her for a long time in school, but when we began to connect and notice each other, uh, which was first year of college, uh, we began to pray. We began to pray and we prayed together on our first date. We prayed together. Uh, we just prayed that, you know, that our time together would go well, but we began to pray together more and more as we prayed to seek the plan, the right plan. It wasn't, I want this person at all cost. It was, we want the right plan, the right person. And that is that kind of passionate desire that builds toward a relationship that lasts a lifetime is not lust. That's something quite different. Lust dwells in the uh, desire and the imagination that leads us into sin, putting things out of the order that God has designed, dwelling on the privileges of marriage without marriage, thinking about that. So God's design for marriage is actually is defined as a covenant where a man leaves his father and mother and a woman leaves her home and they become married and the two become one. That's, that's what Jesus defined it as. That's what Genesis defines it as. That's what the Apostle Paul defines it as. So is Jesus saying that lust is just as bad as doing some act of sin? Um, and we talked about that last week. I mean, is anger just as bad as murder? Without repentance, both are sin, and both separate us from God. So we don't want to miss that. Both are sin, and both separate us. We need to repent, confess those things. But obviously, the damaging consequences are, are quite different. The scars that are left are quite different. So we must not rationalize actions. Well, we've been thinking these things. We might as well do them. No. That's not the direction to go. And we must not miss the huge damage that is done in this arena by lust. Um, there's Advertising is one thing, but there's an elephant in the room of our culture, and it's the four-letter word porn. And we don't hear as much talk about it uh, these days because it, it so proliferates across our culture. The pornography industry... One estimate uh, says that it generates $12 billion in annual revenue, larger than the combined annual revenues of ABC, NBC, and CBS. That would make it one of, if not the most prominent, entertainment uh, industries in, in our culture. That's embarrassing, isn't it? I mean, it's just sort of stunning. Uh, of that number, uh, the internet pornography industry generates $2.5 billion in annual revenue. Now, many think that's a low estimate. Ten years ago, Forbes magazine estimated that pornography revenue is $56 billion annually. A lot of it goes now through cryptocurrency. It's not even traceable. And so it's just a rampant thing that goes on and on. And the problem is that the abuse of people, humans, dear to God, is the enormous cost of this sin. We say, well, it's a victimless sin. Well, I looked at this thing and it wasn't a big deal. It didn't hurt anybody. I didn't hurt anybody. Oh, no. By participating, it hurts the people at the end of the revenue strain, at the end of that chain. The porn industry is tied to human trafficking. It damages hundreds of thousands of people every year. Secular studies reveal that the porn industry leads to addiction, isolation, increased aggression, distorted beliefs and perceptions about relationships and sexuality, uh, negative feelings about oneself, negative uh, feelings and neglect of other areas of life. And this is a sort of stunning thing. Half of the participants in this industry, we say, well, this is a freedom. They're free to do what they want. Half of the participants in this industry were forced to make pornography while they were enslaved in some way. That is not a victimless crime. That is not a victimless criminal enterprise. And it's not an entertainment domain that should be normalized. And that's what we see. You know, I remember maybe 10 or 15 years ago when uh, late night 
comedians began to joke about, hey, uh, yeah, he was looking at his porn online and, and they're porn this and they're porn that. Like, well, this is just a normal thing and you shouldn't, this is something to yuck, yuck, laugh, laugh about. And, it, and it's become normalized, unless it's in a workplace, and then it becomes uh, an adversarial workplace, okay? But it's, it's proliferating, and we need to be aware of this and know. I'll tell you, the biggest thing that helped me with this is to realize, when you look at a person, that is somebody's daughter, somebody's wife, somebody's mommy, somebody's sister, or brother, or dad, or son. These are people God created, and we don't want to be connected to that chain. So how do we deal with this? Well, Jesus used a blunt and graphic image, uh, and, and we want to understand it. Um, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It's better to lose one uh, of your members than to have your whole body thrown into hell. Uh, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away, for it is better to lose one of your members than to, your, for your whole body to go into hell. Now, we need to clarify and say, of course, Jesus was not talking about literal self-mutilation. Uh, I mean, this is one of those verses. If somebody comes and says, well, I'm a literalist, I believe exactly what it says word for word, you, well, <laughs> let's look at this. Because if we take this literally, we would have a whole lot of blind people, amen? And a whole lot of people without at least one hand, right? So of course that's not what Jesus was talking about. But he was saying to us, this is such, it's not a matter to be taken lightly. That's what he was saying. Enticement to sin must be dealt with rapidly and radically. Radically meaning complete removal uh, Jesus was saying, do whatever it takes to change the environment, to prevent the opportunity to fall into this situation, to fall into lust. Hesitation is what opens the door to be dragged away. So what I want to do is point us to three scriptural responses that, that we find in the Bible. And the first is run. Run. Do you remember Joseph, uh, Old Testament Joseph uh, in the story, uh, Genesis chapter 39, and he had been taken, uh, sold as a slave by his brothers, and he was working in the, in the house of Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife took a fancy to him, thought he was good looking, and she began to say, won't you come and lie with me? You know, your boss is gone, he's out of town, just come and lie with me. And so, uh, and so he refused, and he refused, and he refused again and again. And finally she said, I want you. And she grabbed him by his garment. And the scripture says, literally, he left his garment in her hand. He wiggled out of his garment and, and fled out of the house. He ran away. Now, the easiest thing would have been to say, well, who's going to know? You know, the boss is out of town. My people are hundreds of miles away. Uh, my family, they worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but, but they are never going to know. They've abandoned me, so I might as well just join in, you know. Whatever happens here, happens here. Nobody will know what happens in Egypt, uh, stays in Egypt. <laughs> but he didn't do that. In fact, what he said was, I cannot do that because I will not dishonor my boss, your husband, and I will not dishonor my God. And that's where we need to be. And so he fled, he ran away. Make an early and quick decision about these things. 2 Timothy 2, the Apostle Paul wrote to young Timothy, young guy, and he says, flee, run away from youthful passions and pursue, passionately pursue these things, righteousness, faith, love, peace, along with all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. In other words, gather around yourself those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Don't have around yourself people who are giving in and joining in these sorts of things. Run away from this sort of stuff. I remember years ago, uh, Chuck Swindoll was teaching on this, and he shared something uh, from, from his past. He said that he was, when he was in the military... Uh, that they went on shore leave, and it was, uh, you know, in, in uh, 
Malaysia or, or you know in that part of the world and they they went on shore leave and they went into this town and they found themselves just very quickly in essentially a red light district where everything was there and everything was for sale and 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 it was all around them and he said I did not know what else to do but to turn and run he said I literally ran I ran as fast as I could back to the ship I ran away from it because that decision not to say, well, well, I won't engage. I'll just, well, I'll just look around. I'll, you know, I'm here with the guys. I'll, maybe I'll drive them home. Or, you know, that's not the decision that helps. The, the second thing is to remove. Remove the thing, the object, or the process that provides an opportunity into the path of sin. That can mean a change of environment. I'm not going to hang out with those friends. I'm not going to go to those places. You know, I don't know if, if you're like us. We wa- we've walked out of movies that we paid good money for because we just said we did not know that this was the direction this movie was going. And so I'll walk out. I won't sit there. And, and so sometimes we have to do that. I've learned more to look in advance. I don't want to walk out and try to understand what the movie is about. Romans chapter 13 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We've talked about that. And make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. That is, don't have a provision that allows you. Don't have a, a method of participating, a plan to participate. Uh, you know, I, I remember years ago I was driving with a friend and he said, I need to pull over. He pulled over to the side and he went around to his trunk and he got in his trunk and he pulled out a carton of cigarettes and he pulled out a pack and he lit, was lighting up. And I said, I thought you quit smoking. He said, I did. I quit again this morning. <laughs> but, but they're expensive, so I put them in my trunk. <laughs> That's a provision. That's assuming that you're, you're going to fall back into that same thing. I remember a number of years ago, a young man, he called me on a Friday afternoon, and he said, can I stop by your house? I said, sure. He came by the house, and, and he said, I just need to give you something. And he, and he held out a bag, one of those fabric shopping bags that you get in the grocery store he held it out to me he said I just need you to hold this for me for the weekend I looked in it it was his computer modem he had disconnected it and he said my my wife's going out of town and I just want to be sure I'm not going to fall back into that stuff again and I said I thought you had software that that kind of filtered all that and kept you he said yeah but I know how to get around that and so he entered to me. I kept it for the weekend. He came back on Sunday evening. I gave it back to him. Sometimes we need to radically remove something that is going to draw us into temptation. Or we know it's a provision for temptation. 2 Corinthians 10 tells us that the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Sometimes we just need some people to pray with us. I have men that pray with me and I pray with them. We need to have people that we pray for one another. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion. A part of that translation is imaginations raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive. That's key, to take every thought captive to obey Christ. The third thing that we find biblically is to renew. It's not enough just to remove a thought or remove a situation We need to put in its place a renewing thought and a renewing heart. David, when he had sinned so terribly, he prayed uh, in Psalm 51, Create in me a clean heart, O God. It's not enough that I just have repented of this. Create in me a clean heart so I don't go there again. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. And take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Let, let, me, let me rejoice, delight in the joy of salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Romans chapter 12 says, do not be conformed to this world. You're going to read all sorts of stuff. You have heard that it was said. You're going to read it all over the place. This is okay. This is good. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing 
you may discern what is the will of God, what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Well, I want to close our service a little bit differently. And uh, what I want to do is invite you to pray with me uh, the words of Scripture. Uh, I'm going to put a prayer up here. It's not in your notes. Uh, But I want us to pray together some of these words, some of these scriptures, word for word, uh, that we've been studying. And some of them are are the essence of that scripture. And just lift our hearts before him. So if you'll look at the screen, uh, I invite you to pray. You don't have to, but I invite you to pray with me this scriptural prayer. Let's pray. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Give me strength to turn away. Give me courage to run from those places that present temptation. Give me wisdom to remove anything that may draw me into sin or draw me away from you. Give me a hunger and thirst for righteousness, a renewed desire for your word, and passionate desire to worship you. My soul thirsts for you, the living God. When shall I come and appear before you? There is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Father, I thank you that your word meets us at the deepest points of need, that your your word confronts us at the place where where we need to hear most from you. And Lord, I pray that that we may gather from this the strength, the courage to hit a pause button, to to stop the hesitation, to, to move in another direction, to run, to flee, to change an environment, to set aside provisions of, for the flesh that we have, have put in place. And Lord, to realize the work you want to do in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.